some time to look at the exhibits. We're very proud of our new exhibits. And um, if you have questions, the staff is here to help you out. Um, I have a few um, sort of administrative things I need to deal with you first before I'm going to turn it over to um, Renee and our curator. Um, in your seats, you have membership applications. We have a very active membership program here, and we would like to invite all of you to join the Historical Society. It would be our pleasure to have you as members and to be able to come to things like this often. Um, we do a lot of programming, and um, we would love to have you. And secondly, there is a survey, and I know everybody makes surveys, but we have to do these for Palm Beach County, and we would really appreciate it if you just fill one in for us. Leave it in your chair, whatever, very casually, but just fill one in. And, um, and at that, I'm going to introduce Renee Johnson, who's going to talk a little bit about what's happened already tonight. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. So good evening. My name is Renee Johnson, and I work at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Uh, this is Jamie Umberger. Um, she's my colleague, and we help run the Fort Lauderdale office. Um, but our footprint is all the way up to Palm Beach. And Earlier today, we had a little time with the author, so it was so nice meeting Carol and learning a little bit about this book, where you'll hear more about. I am a member of the Historical Museum. Our family, our family um, joined, and probably more because when we have people come, we just are so proud. We want to show <coughs> off everything that's happened here. Um, so I'm, we're so excited about talking tonight about the 19th Amendment, when and when the vote and together we'll learn about this event and its significance. Um, and please, if you have a chance, share with me um, your favorite woman in history, because we kind of all have one, right? Like they, uh, we're on the shoulders of other women, so to speak. Um, and thank you to the men who intentionally have created a landscape where women have the same opportunities to participate in politics and freedom that men have. So thank you so much for having us, J.P. Morgan Private Bank, and we're happy to support this and other history events. I'm going to turn it over to the curator, and Jamie, thanks so much for coming tonight with me. Well, thank you. So um, just a little preview because we talked about this earlier. For those of you who weren't with us, there's a photo up here with a lady in the picture, okay? That's um, Harriet Gates. Uh, one of our pioneers came in the teens from uh, Rutland, Vermont, and uh, she was a um, uh, very, uh, wouldn't call her liberal, <laughs> Yankee lady, uh, and in fact, she was the president of the Women's Suffrage League uh, when women got the vote. Uh, I mentioned to Carol and our group that we have the diaries of a man named Frank Tisro, um, who came from 1903 in, from Michigan, and he kept a daily diary until he passed in the 30s, and it's a time machine. So sure enough, on election day, 1920, he wrote, women voted, that's it. Uh, but the other, <laughs> but, but you think of the, what that meant, you know. You, you have to read into Frank's little diary entries. The other kind of fun story I was telling you had to do with Fort Lauderdale. Um, Ivy Stranahan, who's considered to be the mother of Fort Lauderdale, was a big time uh, suffragist. Uh, May Man Jennings, who was the governor's wife, uh, and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, you all recognize that name, were, were fighting for women's suffrage. And Marjorie remembered in later years that the three of them went to Tallahassee to campaign for passage of the um, uh, ratification uh, of the amendment. Uh, and she said, those boys from beyond the black waters of the Swami said, no damn way they're going to tell us what to do. <laughs> sure enough. Florida didn't ratify until, what was it, 69? It was, it was 1969. 1969. Okay. <laughs> it was symbolic. It was symbolic. Yeah. Symbolic. Yeah. So I want to introduce our wonderful guest speaker today, Carol Crossy. Uh, she began her human and civil rights activism when she was a student at Howard University back in the day. Um, and she has been a, a facilitator and leader in Nonviolent civil disobedience since the 70s, uh, protesting the Vietnam War, uh, being an advocate for 
uh, human rights, particularly for indigenous populations. I like that. Um, and she was also an editorial assistant to the New York State Feminist um, newspaper mm -hmm. uh, and a past editor of Voices for Peace and Life uh, and a contributor to pro-life feminism yesterday and today. So um, she's from Rochester, That's she'll right. tell you. Uh, in 2006, she purchased the rather dilapidated at the time, Susan B. Anthony birthplace in Adams, Massachusetts, and led the charge to restore it. So she will tell you a little bit about that. Uh, but because of her interest, she's been co collecting suffrage-related postcards, which she'll tell you all about these many years. Uh, and this is her book called Vintage Tweets, and I'll let her explain why it's called that. Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I think, is this on? This is on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was interesting um, about the ratification. In just to say that in 1920, you needed uh, three quarters of the states, and I, I think it's the same today, to pass an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So there were 48 states in 1920. So that meant you needed 36 states, right? Uh, the last state, they had 35 for quite a while, for three or four years, and finally Tennessee came on board, so that made the 36th state. Florida was one of the 12 that did not ratify it. As a matter of fact, it never came up for ratification in the state of Florida. Other states voted it down, uh, but Florida was, I believe, the only state that it didn't come up for ratification. Uh, it was introduced by um, an assemblyman in Palm Beach, but he made it clear that he wasn't going to really vote for that. So they knew it wouldn't pass, and so it was never even brought up for a vote. So symbolically, it was passed in the state in 1969. Obviously, all the women in the state could vote in 1920, as they could in no matter what where you lived in the United States. So just a little bit of that history. Um, Susan B. Anthony was born in 1820, and in 1920, 100 years later, the suffrage amendment passed, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. So uh, this book was put together um, in anticipation of the anniversary. Um, it was finished in 2019 right before the pandemic. Um, so a lot of the presentations of the postcards were done by Zoom. And it lends itself beautifully to a Zoom presentation because you're going to be looking at images. Uh, and the images are, to, to a large extent, in chronological order according to the suffrage story. So the postcards tell the story of suffrage in their own language, in their, by their own propaganda. The book uh, that I did put out on some of the chairs, and many of you have purchased prior to this event, um, it tells the story um, in their own word, in, in their own pictures. There's not a lot of narrative in the book that you see. Um, there's a narrative prior to the themes of the book. The book is separated into 11 different themes, and we will talk about those. Um, but the themes are introduced, but there's not a lot of verbiage because we allow the suffrage story to be told by their own propaganda. So this is fun. Um, I started collecting these um, after the, well, prior to the birthplace purchase and restoration. Um, the reason why I purchased the birthplace, my husband is still wondering why I did that. <laughs> but you know what? I'm a strong woman, right? Yeah. Are you still talking to him? I am still talking to him. So basically, I was very active. There's a Susan B. Anthony Museum in Rochester, New York, where I live. She lived her activist years in Rochester. So I'm very familiar with Susan B. Anthony, was 
a member there for many, many years and attended many of those le lectures. And I just love Susan B. Anthony. Um, so when her birthplace came up for auction, because it was literally falling apart, uh, over the internet, pictures of her birthplace were circulated. And I noticed, hey, her birthplace is almost identical to the house that I restored and live in today. My house is a Quaker Federal 1825. It is on the historic registry. I knew I could restore her birthplace. The second reason, besides the fact that I loved Susan B. Anthony, was that I had a lot of ephemera under my bed that I didn't know what to do with. So this is a perfect reason to do that. Um, I'm going to see if I can change this and all good things at the same time. Oh, maybe not. Let's see. Am I doing this right? Down. Back down. OK. So in 2020, or in, uh, in 2020, it was the 200th anniversary of Susan B. Anthony's birth and the 100th anniversary of the suffrage centennial. In this, uh, the first few pictures here uh, are just pictures of the birthplace restored today just to give you a little bit of a feel for that. This on the left is the picture where Susan B. Anthony was born in the house. On the right is her father's store. Daniel um, owned, constructed, owned, and built the first uh, whole cloth textile mill in the Berkshires. And so he sold his cloth in the store of their home. Um, this is a picture that hangs above the walk-in fireplace, the restored walk-in fireplace at the Birthplace Museum. And if you're wondering, gee, did they have photography when Susan B. Anthony was only six years of age? No, they did not. This was a creation um, and a gift when the museum opened by Synthespian Studios. It was a, um, a uh, they produced, uh, the Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man, uh, the Polar Express, it's a Hollywood outfit. So what they did to create this picture is they regressed pictures of Susan B. Anthony at an, a later age when she did have her picture taken. But in some ways, it is a somewhat of a violation of Susan. Her parents were Quakers. They would not have approved of her image being displayed. Uh, only profiles, you know, you see those uh, silhouettes, those would be Quaker silhouettes. So it was prideful to, uh, to show the inner light. And so this, in some ways, is a, somewhat of a violation to show and to produce this picture. This is the house today as it is restored. And the way that we knew how to restore it was from some of the early illustrations of the postcards um, that you will see. And now we will begin the old postcard. This is the, one of the iterations of a postcard of Susan's home. This one was uh, sent. I don't know for sure when it was produced, but it was sent in 1902. And we learned how to reproduce the house and to restore it uh, by looking at these early iterations. The door on the side there um, had to be uh, reconstructed because it had been taken down, uh, a number of other things. So the house sits on a rural road in Adams, Massachusetts, which is in the Berkshires. It sits at the foot of Mount Greylock, which is the highest peak in the Berkshires. Susan spoke about from her bedroom she could see Mount Greylock. It still is on a little side road on a hill, and it's on the way to nowhere. So it sits <laughs> off to its side, uh, and that's still true today. These are. These are Susan's parents, Daniel on the left. Uh, and he sold in his store. He was a Quaker. His wife, Lucy Reed, uh, was a Baptist. And she gave up her colorful clothes and dancing to, to marry Daniel. Um, Daniel uh, actually sold rum in his store. And that was a no-no to the Quakers. He got into a lot of trouble for that. 
he actually gave up the sale of liquor when there was a young man who was found dead in a snowstorm, uh, inebriated, and so that was the end of the liquor sale for Daniel. This is the house where, uh, this is the Quaker meeting house, and of course this is about uh, one and a half miles from Susan's home in North Adams, it, in Adams. It still is in pristine condition today. I often have uh, show the postcard presentation to students and I point out that men are on one side and women are the, on the other. There are actually two doors to go into the Quaker Meeting House. Um, they were one of, even though they did participate in segregation of the sexes, they were one of the few religious sects to um, allow women preachers. Susan's own aunt, her, her father, Daniel's sister, Anna Hoxie, was actually a Quaker preacher. And this is one of the early iterations of Susan's pictures, a photograph of her. This was um, taken in, 19, in 1844. Photography was invented in 1839, and I know that because Rochester is the home of Kodak. Uh, I learned so much from these because people will correct me in the audience, and so that's so good. <laughs> so she is a teacher here. Uh, Susan was a teacher for only eight years, and one wonders what her parents would have thought about her gingham dress uh, and even having her photograph taken at all. Um, she, uh, in her teaching career, uh, during those eight years, she, it shaped the rest of her life because, like other teachers, she became active in the temperance movement. And so why would that be? Um, as a teacher, she believed and she knew that children were abused, um, wives were abused, um, mothers who were abused by drunken husbands abused their children. She saw that liquor consumption was damning. And she and other teachers, this was their motto, that your boys may go to the to ruin through the legalized saloon by your consent, but they never will be by my consent. Teachers believed that we needed money from liquor consumption, liquor the saloon industry, taxes to go to school books and education for children. Um, so they actually um, believed that their scant resources needed to be used for children's shoes, children's books. But Susan, in her naivete, found out that, strangely enough, when she went to these anti-liquor consumption meetings, the temperance meetings, she was not allowed to speak. So she and her colleagues in the education industry joined the Women's Christian Temperance Union. They wanted to prevent things like the swill milk epidemic. And that was something that was in 1859, uh, was happening with uh, children were dying in New York City. They didn't know why. Women knew why. They knew that if they had the vote, they'd take care of it. It was actually a contamination of, of cow's milk from whiskey mash. And nothing was done about that until 1896. Women knew if they had the vote, they could have done something about that. So in order to advance family health and moral character in the home, they needed civic engagement. They needed the vote. Um, even beasts of burden left outside of saloons were subject to the cr cruelties of liquor consumption. Women saw temperance as a method to 
temper or moderate male aggression in the marital bed. And so suffrage supported what was called voluntary motherhood and control over family size. And it was directly tied, they believed, to liquor consumption. Susan B. Anthony's newspaper, The Revolution, deals uh, a lot with vegetarianism and uh, cruelty to animals, but this is the only postcard that I've ever seen that does that. But it was not just liquor. Colorful characters like Carrie Nation condemned cigarette smoking and added that to the ruination of young males. Cards with Carrie are everywhere. They are very abundant. She produced and created her own cards in order to fund her own activism. Carrie lived in Kansas. Her first husband died from alcohol consumption. Her second husband's last name was Nation, so she gave herself the middle initial of A, so she was Carrie a Nation. <laughs> she also produced and sold small hatchets, because she's the one that smashed the saloons with the hatchet. She sold small hatchets and, and other kinds of jewelry that would feature a hatchet. And the birthplace actually has one of these on display, one of the original small pin hatchets, very fun. Uh, but the liquor industry would take every opportunity to mock suffrage. And so they believed that if women got the vote, they would just uh, deteriorate into male values and smoke and drink too. Um, this particular postcard is from the grouping of leather postcards. And it displays the suffrage sunflower, the sunflower representing the state of Kansas. Kansas is featured a lot. Uh, Kansas, of course, was the first state to have municipal suffrage, and so women adopted that state flower as their own suffrage symbol. It graces stationery, it graces uh, china. We have some of the original china with the sunflower. It graces linen. Um, and of course, the sunflower is hardy. You know, it is, you cannot destroy sunflower. It can go without water. Uh, it, can, it can, you know, survive in heat. So it really is a good symbol for suffrage. And so leather postcards, yeah, there were leather postcards. Can you believe it? These were made of deer hide. 1902 was the first one. And they lasted until 1909. Uh, and that was because the new postal machines could not cancel them. But you'll see um, the markings around the edges of the examples of leather postcards in the section on po leather postcards in the book. And all of them have these markings, and that's because handcrafters would create tablecloths, uh, pillowcases with these, uh, with these cards. I have yet to find one, but I learned about this from the U.S. Postal Museum at the Smithsonian, uh, who did a story on the collection of postcards. And so I'm called a deltiologist, according to them. That's what they call me, someone who collects postcards. Uh, so that's very fun, isn't it? That, that it, they continued to sell for almost 10 years later those postcards, very fun. So, there was a book that was written in 1852 that really changed the whole nature of our country. And that book was Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, it propelled suffragists into connecting the domestic sphere and the social morality of the day. It made the demand for the vote even more compelling. And so you had temperance, abolition, and suffrage, which proved to be an unstoppable triangulation of radical women. It was the greatest mass movement that the world had ever known to that point. 
a civic dialogue ensued about property rights and whether a human being could be owned by another human being. And outside of the polarizing North and South was, yes again, Kansas. It was the home not only of Cary Nation, it was not only the home of where the first women's vote for municipal voting happened, it was also uh, the state where John Brown organized his army. John Brown, <clears throat> a member of John Brown's army was Merritt Anthony. Merritt was Susan's youngest male sibling. And we can only imagine what her parents' pacifist leanings would have thought about Merritt being a member of John Brown's army. He was not part of Harper's Ferry. Um, but Susan herself did not throw herself at all into the support of the Civil War. She could not do that. Um, these, these postcards, uh, this is, of course, Harriet Tubman. Uh, we just recently did a program for the Harriet, with the Harriet Tubman Museum. Um, and so this postcard is not in the book. When I find out I'm going somewhere and doing something, I'll try to find a postcard. And I do not believe that this is an authentic one. It is a representation. You know, you can tell if they're authentic or not. Not always. Um, I think there are probably 18 of the postcards in that book which are representations, which were copies. If you buy them over the internet, you cannot be sure. Um, so I, I do indicate which ones in the book are actual real postcards. I have a, a book up here of the postcards which you're free to look at. We have about 13 of those volumes of postcards. Um, of course, not all of them are in the book, but again, this one is a representation and we added it for this particular Harriet Tubman event. But, um, yeah, so, oh, yeah, this one is for Lucretia Mott. Again, we're doing something at the Union League in Philadelphia in a couple weeks, so we added that one kind of quickly for that event. They're doing an uncovering, an unveiling of a portrait of Lucretia Mott, who was a suffragist in Philadelphia. But Lincoln, of course, was appropriated. Um, these, you know, postcards demonstrate how every movement, whether suffrage, temperance, or abolition, appropriated Lincoln for their cause. Uh, prohibition, there was um, uh, a temperance regiment in the Civil War, which Lincoln supported. Uh, about suffrage, he says, and that's a little hard to believe, uh, to read, he says, I believe in sharing in the privileges of government by no means excluding women. That is a very lukewarm endorsement, but Anthony uh, and her abolition colleagues clung to that. But Anthony <clears throat> thought that the new president was really too weak in his opposition to slavery. She stated that her cause was for human rights, not just women's rights. As a matter of fact, when Susan's father passed away in 1862, she asked Frederick Douglass to do the eulogy, and you can imagine how uncommon that was. Uh, this kind of friendship was really unheard of prior to the emancipation and throughout the entire 19th century. Let's see what are we doing here. Sorry about that. So this next card is Ida B. Wells. And Ida B. was a friend of Susan's. Ida was an anti-lynching activist. So she was uh, in the news a lot in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Susan B. Anthony talks about in her biography uh, about a Negro woman who stayed with her and needed some mending. Susan asked her 
uh, seamstress to do a repair. Her seamstress refused because the woman was Negro. Susan B. Anthony fired her seamstress. But <clears throat> despite this personal demonstration of friendship, modern day scholars accuse Anthony and other suffragists of being racist. Uh, this is not without merit. Uh, this is an image that is actually not a postcard. It's one of only two in the book that is not a postcard, but I wanted to put it in. It was from the museum. It's the cover of a small pamphlet, and it displays the anger and hostility that women suffragists uh, of the period had toward the African-American community. This was <clears throat> because when Lincoln passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution, the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote, excluded black women and white women. So they were furious about that. They felt that they had given so much of their passion and their time and their energy. As a matter of fact, during the Civil War, they, um, they put on hold their suffrage activism because uh, they felt so strongly in favor of the emancipation of slaves. And so they felt betrayed, and they were very, very angry. The suffrage movement split into two factions, as a matter of fact. In 1869, one of those factions was called the American Women's Suffrage Association, and it was led by Lucy Stone. The other, and they believed it was the Negro Hour. Yes, let's celebrate the fact that the Negro has the vote, and our time will come. The other faction was called the National Women's Suffrage Association, and that was uh, led by Susan B. Anthony. And she believed in universal suffrage. She would have none of it. She said it's all or nothing. This is a handmade card. Again, it's part of the abolition um, uh, section in the card. But again, you see the racism in this card. Um, and so in our museum, we have a few other items that demonstrate the racism of the suffragists. Uh, there's a lot of anger about that when people come in, but we feel that we need to show the truth. There was a young woman on a tour that I took on Sunday of Pearl City. Marjorie, are you here? Marjorie, there you are. And she had a t-shirt on. Do you remember it, Marjorie? It said, what? Help me out. Uh, Developing interracial social change? It, uh, there was one of those, and there was one that said, if you, you have to feel uncomfortable with history. Remember that? History has to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, that was excellent, yeah. So I was telling her about you know, our own displays. So this next one is so exciting. Uh, this is called the study of phrenology. Does anybody know what phrenology is? Do you know what it is? I, I tell you, I learned so much doing this. So the guy on the left up there is a, was a well-known criminal of African descent. The person on the right was a British diplomat, and someone told me that he was actually a prime minister. Um, Balfour. And so <clears throat> you can imagine whose head she wants to be related to. Now, she's a, got this Votes for Women pamphlet on her, on her lap, and you can see that she's this testosterone, angry woman, right, because she's for the vote. Uh, so you can imagine uh, how she wants her head read. So it was like a parlor game, similar to signature analysis was in the 1950s and 60s, although this was taken much more seriously. There are books that are written on it. It was during a period of the Darwinian time, 
And so I put it in the abolition section and consider it eugenic. Susan herself had her head read. And I want to read to you, if I can find it here. I hope I can. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. So uh, Susan had her read, head read in 1859. And we have, 1852, we have in the museum a bust of Susan, and it's right at waist level, and children come in and they can feel her head, and they can read on the wall what this particular uh, head reader said about Susan. We had a group of uh, children from the School of the Blind come in, and so they were able to feel Susan's profile. It was very exciting. But this is what they said in 1859. And of course, 1852, Susan was not well known, right? And so this is what this head read, read, reader said. Hmm. The convolutions of the brain must be and are remarkable for multiplicity and depth. There is that peculiar tension of the scalp and that subtle magnetic emanation by which the experienced examiner recognizes a high order of cerebral power and activity. This is a brain in which there is no waste, no superfluous expenditure. This is a woman with a purpose from which she will never swaver. So that was kind of fun. <clears throat> All right. So the, the revolution. After the Civil War, Anthony published the revolution, by far the most outspoken woman-run newspaper of its time. And the Birthplace Museum has, I was told, the largest collection of her newspapers in the country. Its first editor was none other than Anthony's colleague and closest ally, Elizabeth Cady, St uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The motto of the newspaper was, men their rights and nothing more, women their rights and nothing less. The inaugural edition stated two policies, and they are portrayed in numerous postcards. The first policy is that there would be no support for standing armies. Suffragists supported less aggressive means to settle conflict. They wanted to bring men out of the bars and off the battlefield into the home where families could be nurtured. But for every postcard that proclaimed a good reason for women to vote, there was going to be hmm, its converse. And so women were just going to devolve and devolve into the values of men and fight wars too. And they probably were going to do it in their high heels here, you can see. <laughs> uh, the second policy of the revolution was that there would be no advertisements for quack or immoral medicines or abortion. This postcard is an ethereal image which portrays the death of a child and a grieving mother. It is published by the Chicago Probation League. Uh, over 20 editorials in Anthony's newspaper, many written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, denounced the practice which was unanimously condemned by suffrage leaders. Using straightforward language to explain abortion, they called it child murder, feticide, evil of the age, and a crime against humanity. The revolution ran lectures on embryology by Anna Dinsmore French, who advocated for the right of women's education as it related to pregnancy and maternity. They wanted to prevent, quote, the destruction of the developing human. They advocated for the right to higher education, to employment, acceptance of single motherhood, believing that injustices like poverty, abortion, prostitution would be limited with the vote. 
another particular interest surrounding the date of this next card. Uh, this is Jane Addams of Hull House. She's pictured on the right. It is also a, picture, a card by the Chicago Probation League. Both of these were Chicago Probation League. By the way, because the postcards are all 100 years of age or more, uh, it was not necessary to, because they're in the public domain, it was not necessary to research the producer or the artists of these cards. But oftentimes, uh, it really is significant. So um, I do mention those uh, quite frequently. Jane, as you all know, was the first woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for her work with immigrant populations. Her work coincided with the invention of the electric chair in 1890. Many suffrage leaders like Adams considered the death penalty a violent practice to solve a crime. In addition, electric shock was actually proposed in a Michigan state legislature. Uh, it was a law that would use the abortion technique as a, would use the electric chair as an abortion technique on disabled children. About this law, Jane Addams said, all children should be welcomed no matter their disability. Abortion is not in line with the march of civilization or the principles of humanity. This next uh, illustration is uh, by Nina Allender, and she is the designing cartoonist for The Suffragist, which was the newspaper of Alice Paul in the National Women's Party. The statement, child saving is women's work, resonates boldly in many, many of the representations throughout the postcards. It connects the domestic sphere and the civic sphere, proclaiming that a woman's vote would strengthen motherhood and families. Allender, by the way, is the one who popularized the donkey for the Democrats and the elephant for the Republicans. <laughs> Very fun. Uh, this next image was actually a postcard made from the cover of a magazine in 1912. And the original of this, I was told, I was told that the original of this by uh, an aqu aquitarian in New York City, that the original was purchased by Bill Clinton for Hillary when she became Secretary of State. <laughs> Very fun. But it's even more fun to know the artist of this one. He is none other than the uh, Montgomery flag, who is the iconic, uh, Uncle Sam Needs You, artist. Very fun. So this push-pull of children and families is the theme of so many of the postcards. Anti-suffragists argued that children would suffer, the home would be abandoned. And, but suffragists countered that the domestic sphere would not be destroyed, that it would be enhanced. Women could do both. And I think the reverse of this, of this card is so exciting. Let me show you this. I don't usually show you the reverse. But you'll notice that on this card, uh, the senders were encouraged to maximize the exposure of the card's message and send it on to another person, and to another person, and to another person. Uh, and it says in the fine print there, if you are in sympathy with this message, affix another stamp, cross off the first recipient, and repost it. So it really is sort of like a retweeting, isn't it? Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, these are some of the more thoughtful expressions among the collection. These were produced by Anthony's <clears throat> National American Women's Suffrage Association. So those two factions that, that d were divergent during over the, the 15th Amendment, they came back. 
and they created the American Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Suffrage Association combined in 1890. It took 21 years for them to come back together and they created the National American Women's Suffrage Association and Susan B. Anthony was the president. These postcards are represented, they were produced uh, by, that, by that association. I have 18 of these in my collection uh, and I understand that there are 24 altogether so I'm still on the search. Um, but postcards often employed non-threatening images of children uh, and also animals to promote their message. You know, they wanted it to be an innocuous message, a gentle message, a message that everyone could identify with. Cards like these were sold at fairs, at church festivals, on street corners in New York City, and they were used, the funds were used to promote their petition campaigns. Um, Aren't these dear? Uh, these sweet images really display the innocence of children making a statement about the virtuousness of suffrage. They demonstrate how children were symbolic of mothers nurturing. And the back of this card is very fun. Um, it was canceled four times. It traveled from Reliance, Virginia on April 13, 1906 at 4.30 p.m., showing three more cancellations on its way to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, where it arrived on April 18th. Uh, the Postal Museum explained to me that these cancellations were not uncommon to have that many on one piece of mail. And by the way, canceled cards were considered more valuable than cards that were not canceled. We're not surprised at that, are we? So even holidays were opportunities to sell items and raise money for the ever popular petition signings and suffrage parades. And Valentines are hands down, I mean, they are just everyone's favorite. The card on the right, is one from Ireland, it's in the foreign section. And so I just put that in today because St. Patrick's Day is coming up. So what's he say? Hunting the Suffy. Votes for women, hunting the Suffy, right? We actually had the Valentines made into note cards um, for Valentine's Day and they're really very popular to sell the note cards of those suffrage images. And it was a um, leap year during a number of the high stakes period during suffrage, uh, 1908, 1912, and of course 1916 were all suffrage uh, leap year years, as was 1920. 2020 was a leap year as well. And so we had these cards, many of these leap year cards made into note cards uh, for 2020. Um, okay, so again, the animals, children and animals, were used by propaganda uh, by those who opposed suffrage as well as those that supported suffrage. And like social media today, no other medium lent itself to exaggeration, to ridicule, and to the hasty tweet of a one cent stamp. And then, of course, women would come back and put men in their place. <laughs> well, and nothing was sacrosanct. You all know who this is. This postcard is a caricature of Anthony herself portraying women as menacing and intimidating. Uh, she was very popular in the postcards. On election day, the antis claimed that women who engaged in politics were going to disrupt the family, and not only were children going to suffer, but fathers who were left to care for the children were going to suffer more. This, these cards are from the artist series in the book, uh, and you can tell them they always have the bright colored 
uh, border on them, and these are everyone's favorite. Male and female roles were going to be reversed. The domestic sphere and the civic sphere were going to be topsy-turvy. Uh, my collection, I have seven of these in my collection, and I understand there are 16 altogether. Uh, this is called the Dunstan Weiler lithographs, and I do identify artists when there is a series like these. Um, another artist series is Walter Wellman. He was a pretty popular artist in the early 20th century, and he's, his cards are all known by their soft greens and their pinks. Um, there are 16 in a full set, and I have 13 of these, but Wellman predicted that there would be frilly senatorises and judgmental judgettes if women got the vote. And a horror of horrors, women would take up things like golf. Uh, I purchased this card in Montana and uh, at a little store, and um, the woman who was selling it to me, she was so apologetic. She said, I'm so sorry, it's got all that writing on it, and it's, you know, it's $3, I can go down on the price. And little did she know that that was really why I wanted that card in particular, was because of all the writing on it. Um, and so Susan B. Anthony pledged her own life insurance to advance education for women. Uh, other women, however, feel disruption in the domestic sphere. They asserted that cheerleading was not really useful knowledge, right? And women who wanted economic rights, the anti-suffragists declared they already had, you know, rights, right? Uh, I can't remember. It says, women are now getting men's wages. They always did. So, uh, <laughs> but a significant revolution was going on that was even greater <clears throat> than, uh, than, you know, the vote. And at this time, it was a measure of women's independence, and that was the bicycle. Susan B. Anthony said that the bicycle represented women's freedom more than any other single domestic item. Not only did this simple two-wheeled contraption propel women toward independence, it was a measure of her independence. And since she couldn't cycle in 11 pounds of petticoats and a girdle, right? Uh, it introduced jet dress reform. The freedom of movement really did require different clothing. Women no longer had to dress in order to please a man. So next to getting the vote, dress reform <clears throat> and condemning abortion, that was the second one, dress reform, was the third most discussed item in the revolution. And I love what this says. It says, she says, is this the way to wear them? Probably wear them in Massachusetts, that city. And he says, I don't know, my old gal always has them underneath. So he says, <laughs> you have to, you just have to love it, don't you? Um, and also in the transportation section, you could go different places and you no longer needed a chaperone. You could go where you pleased. This is another one of the leather postcards and you can see the spaced markings on the edges making it easy for hand crafters. Um, but this jocular exchange extended to other modes of transportation. Here we go. <laughs> Both sides added uh, to the uh, triviality of the debate. Women's suffrage was not a popular position among Democrats. They, it was really the party of Lincoln that supported suffrage. But even Woodrow Wilson, uh, who finally approved the 19th Amendment, did so without enthusiasm. And so everything was about who was going to buy the pants and own the pants and who was going to wear the pants in the family. But postcard propaganda was not all innocent. These representations are in a section called violence. Many of the hostile images in my collection were actually printed 
in Germany for the American market in 1917. Uh, I didn't really read this anywhere, but I am just making a, a leap here and saying that I believe that they were produced and distributed by the American Brewers Association. It was one of the stronger beer producers who wanted to silence women who favored prohibition because the saloon industry and the liquor unions knew what would happen to them if women got the vote. So it's really no surprise that the 19th Amendment was passed only after the Prohibition Amendment, right? Prohibition was passed in um, actually 1918, and it was signed into law in 1919. Uh, and so people felt like the, the saloon industry really felt that, um, you know, we could go ahead and pass suffrage because there was no reason to continue the opposition to suffrage. Mm -hmm. And that Anheuser Busch is in St. Louis. It's probably put uh, there's I mean, there's a connection there. there. Absolutely. That's very that's a very good connection. Thank you for that. So again, this is in the violence section. There's just a numerous ones of these that are just extremely hostile. Um, in the postcards from other countries, the militancy of Great Britain's suffragettes. Uh, iconic window smashing was used to both promote and oppose suffrage in the American movement. The American suffragettes, by the way, we call European suffragists, they were called suffragettes, okay? In the United States, we called ourselves suffragists because we were not cute little majorette things. You know, we were serious, we were suffragists. So that's the difference in the language. Um, but Alice Paul, of course, did not support violent means. She did support what she called militant nonviolent means, like uh, hunger strikes, right? Uh, other cards in the foreign section are from Italy, France, many from Great Britain, Estonia, Mexico, Italy, the Netherlands. So yeah, all very, very exciting. Photography became an asset to the cause in the years immediately prior to the passage of suffrage. No longer were descriptions of rallies and parades left up to the biases of newspapers. You could see for yourself how many people came out for a parade. But again, humor proliferated. Here, men in drag are purporting to be a women's baseball team claim that they use their lefts to fight for women's rights. Don't you love it? Very fun. But Anthony could never have imagined it. Her photo traveled all over the world. And truly, failure was impossible. Thank you so much. Are, is there time for questions, comments, please? Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is in our audience someone who wrote, voted almost illegally. Pat, right here. So, you know, I'd love your story. Just. Can you just briefly tell us your story? Tape of 
um, because there was a strong anti-American sentiment in South America. Uh, but he built factories all over South America. And um, when I turned 18, we were still under the military dictatorship. And my mom, my dad had died by then, my mom said, we've got to go vote. And she got me out of school and said, took me to the American Embassy and of course told me who I had to vote for. <laughs> <laughs> my family has always been ex, and this is what you're going to do. But I was the only kid in my class. We never had civics classes or anything, but I was the only kid in my class and among my friends who actually got to vote. And I, and I really felt extremely proud of that. Um, so, um, yeah, so that was my story. Yes. Oh, all right. Uh, yes. How long did it take you to acquire? Uh, how long have you been working on this project? About 20 years. 20, yeah. Yeah, and of course, you could see there's still a lot to, more to collect. Uh, I understand from um, Ken, oh my goodness, Flory. Uh, he has collected postcards uh, for years and years and has written books, but he says there's 2,200 suffrage postcards. I only have 650, so I have a long ways to go. <laughs> but that's a good question. Another question I usually get is, um, what, how much do these postcards cost? Um, the cheapest one I ever bought was that one for $3 that I told you about. But the most expensive one was about $62. Um, right around 2020, 2019, 2020, and since then, suffrage ephemera has really skyrocketed. It's very expensive now. Yeah. Carol, we yes. have 